time for chapter three of Stig of the Dump, It Warms You Twice. Christmas was over at Grandmother's house. The old oak beams were still decorated with trails of ivy and there were still branches of holly stuck in the tops of picture frames. The last turkey bone had been picked, the last symbol found in the pudding. They had even got a good way around the Christmas cake. They had been to a circus. Barney lay in bed in the grey morning light. For once he was not in a hurry to jump out of bed. The air in the bedroom felt icy to the end of his nose. Let me see, he thought. Is there anything special to look forward to today? He couldn't think of anything. He was looking at the thick black beam in the wall that grew out of the floor right up to the ceiling. It had been part of a ship before it was part of the house, Grandfather said. It had deep holes cut out of it where other bits of timber had fitted into it. What was that hidden in one of the holes? Barney sat up in bed suddenly. It was the flint, Stig's flint, left there since last time he had come to stay. And he hadn't even thought about Stig all over Christmas. He got out of bed and looked out of the window. There was a white frost on the grass. A few hopeful birds hung, out, hung about the bird table, fluffed up like woolly balls, waiting for some food to be put out for them. He reached up and took out the flint. It was like a lump of ice. I wonder what it's like being living in that cave these days, thought Barney. Poor Stig, he must be freezing cold. After breakfast, Barney slipped out of the house and went off to the pit. In the copse, the frozen leaves crunched like cornflakes under his feet. He climbed down into the pit on the far side where the cliff was lowest and it hurt his fingers to hold on to the icy tree roots. The nettles were all dead in the bottom of the pit and the old cans have lump, had lumps of solid ice in them. There was no sign of life in the shelter, though he noticed the ashes of a small dead fire and a faint smell of wood smoke still hung around. But at the back of the cave was a kind of nest made of bracken and dead grass and newspaper. He thought he heard breathing sounds coming out of it. Stig! Barney called. Nothing happened. I wonder if he's like a dormouse, he thought, and goes to sleep all the winter. He called again. Stig! Are you there? There was a rustle in the nest and a mop of black hair popped up out of it. Underneath was Stig's face, but it was screwed up in a very strange expression. Is he cross? wondered Barney anxiously. His eyes still screwed up and his mouth shut. Stig took a deep breath. Then he sneezed. It was a sneeze like a cannon going off and it made the cave echo. You did give me a fright, said Barney. You've got a cold, Stig. No wonder when you live in this damp place, you need a good fire. He looked around the shelter and the cave. There didn't seem to be any wood to burn. Stig's heavy flint axe was leaning against the wall and Barney picked it up, but he saw that the edge was crumbled and blunt. You'll have to sharpen this, said Barney. Stig crawled out of his nest, blinking stupidly. He moved as if his joints were rusty and he did not take the axe as Barney held it out to him. All right, I'll do it then, said Barney. I expect it's quite easy. He sat down with the axe between his knees and picked up a heavy iron bolt and tried to remember how he had seen, seen, seen Stig chip the flint. But it was painful holding the cold flint and the cold iron and his fingers were so clumsy that they would not even do what he wanted them to. Oh, never mind, said Barney. Come on, we've got to get some wood. He stood up with the axe and went out of the shelter. Stig followed, half awake, half frozen and silent. They climbed up out of the pit and looked around the copse for the wood to cut. Barney could now see that someone, probably Stig, had already been chopping and breaking down the dry, bran the dry branches. He chose a fairly thin thorn tree and set, to and set to work on it. The axe swung, the tree shook, the flint bounced off the tough bark but he didn't seem to be getting anywhere. Stig just squatted miserably on the bank, with his arms wrapped around his knees. Here, you have a go, puffed Barney. It'll warm you up anyhow. My grandfather always said wood warms you twice, once when you cut it up and once when you burn it. He handed the axe to Stig, but Stig only looked at it sadly and shook his head. Barney got worried. He really must do something about Stig. Suddenly, he had an idea. Wait here, Stig, he said. I won't be long. Barney ran, ran off through the copse and up to the field towards the house. 
He went to the shed at the back and got his grandfather's big steel axe and the long, sharp, cross-cut saw. And what else did he need? Yes, a coil of rope. He slung it over his shoulder and made off again down the field to the copse. Here you are, Stig, he called, as he came up to Stig still huddled on the bank. The sight of the shining steel axe worked like, a, like medicine on Stig. He uncurled himself and picked up the axe by its long handle. He tried its sharp edge with his thumb. He weighed it in his hands and swung it like a golfer testing a new club. His black eyes lit up and he looked around for something to use his new weapon on. Standing amongst the saplings of the copse was a tall ash tree with a trunk at least two foot thick. Stig marched up to it, swinging the axe. Oh no, cried Barney, you mustn't. Not that one, Stig. But there was no stopping Stig. At the first blow, the blade bit deep into the tree. White chips flew as he swung again and again. Barney hopped round him excitedly. Stig, he called, do you think you ought to? Oh, Stig, isn't it too big? Stig, Stig! I didn't know you were such a chopper. Well done, Stig. Stig, Stig, let me have a go. There was soon a great wedge cut into the side of the tree, but it was still only halfway through. Stig stopped for a rest and they both looked at the tree. It swayed a little in the light breeze. Do you know what, Stig, said Barney? It's going to fall and smash the fence if we're not careful. I'd better tie a rope to it. He swung the coil of rope round him and pulled himself up by the lower branches of the tree. He had climbed most of the trees round here before, but he'd never climbed the one that was already chopped halfway through. He supposed you should have tied the rope on before they'd started cutting. As he climbed higher, he could feel something different about the swaying of this tree. It did not have the springy, exciting sway of a sound tree. It was only swaying a few inches, but at the end of each sway, you had the feel that it was waiting, not quite sure whether it would sway, sway back again or whether it would just go on and fall. He tied the rope to the trunk of the tree as high up as he dared, threw the rope outwards and watched it uncoil itself to the ground and scrambled down again himself. Now, we ought to saw it on the other side, said Barney. I've seen my grandfather do it. He picked up the big cross-cut saw. Here, you take the other end, he called it old Stig. Stig looked at the saw doubtfully. He felt his sharp teeth and grunted approval. But he still did not understand what they were going to do with it. Look, said Barney, you hold that end and I'll hold this end. I pull, then you pull. It's easy once you get started. Stig looked a bit blank. They, they scrapped away clumsily at the back of the, tr at the tree trunk until at last they saw the teeth cut a straight edge groove and settled into it. Stig's eyes widened as the sawdust began to fly and he pumped the handle furiously. Ouch! cried Barney. You're pulling too far. You've made me skin my knuckles. Steady! cried Barney. Must we go so fast? We've got a long way to go yet. Stop! cried Barney. Look Stig, you're pushing as well as pulling. It makes the saw bend and it makes you tired too. At last they settled down to a steady, steady out, steady in, steady out, snar, snar. The blade sang as it bit deeper into the wood and the sawdust spurted out at each end. Then the whole thing seemed to get sticky and at last, however hard they struggled, they could not move it either way. Bother, said Barney. Now what? They stood back and looked at the tree. The weight of the branches on one side was making the trunk lean that way and closing up the crack that, that Saw had made. We'll have to pull, said Barney. Stig and, Stig and he took the end of the rope and heaved. The crest of the tree came slowly towards them, hung still and swayed back again. They heaved again. This time the tree seemed to come a little further, hung longer, but still it swung back. With their third pull, as it rocked towards them, there came a cracking sound from inside the trunk. It's coming, said Barney excitedly. The tree swayed away from them again. But they heaved again, and this time they had even more splintering cracks. Once more, shouted Barney. They tugged, the tree rocked, hung at the end of its swing, then instead of rocking back again, lurched forwards, lurched further over towards them. From the trunk came a splitting, rending, screeching sound, and Stig and Barney turned and ran. Barney heard an appalling rush and crash and splintering of branches behind him as the crest hit the ground, 
and the topmost twigs thrashed at the back of his legs as he ran. They turned round to look. Barney's heart was bouncing with excitement. Phew! We've done it! he gasped, gaping at the ruin they had made and the great empty hole that had left the skyline. What a lot of firewood! And we will carry on with that tomorrow. So we'll have the rest of chapter three. See you tomorrow!